Hello everyone, my name is Bandit, and today I continue my ranking of players, this time with the runners up. I'll be ranking all 10 play Australian Survivor contestants from 2016 to Blood vs Water. The same ranking criteria applies for my winner rankings in terms of replicatability. So even though all these individuals don't win, I'll be looking at how replicatable their games are to achieve a win in a simulation of Survivor Seasons. This will also mean Sharn will be ranked twice. Once for her All-Star game, once for her Champions vs Contenders game. I rank on the games themselves rather than the players overall. Plus, this video allows me to respond to some of the comments in my previous video. So let's go. Out of the 8 games, I think it should be obvious who makes my bottom 2 if you know my criteria by now. Being voted out of the game, for me, is such a big negative in my eyes as you're essentially failing at every facet of the game and relying on luckily ending up booted on a non-elimination episode. I know people have said Australian Survivor has more non-elimination episodes than the likes of US Survivor, so I shouldn't be as harsh, but the principles still remain. The same of being outwitted, outplayed and outlasted immensely in one fell swoop, plus non-elimination episodes still happen sparsely on Australian Survivor in the grand scheme of things. With that, this segues into number 8, who is voted out of the game, but it's probably not who you're expecting, because at 8, I have one of the two most recent runner-ups in Shay from Blood vs Water. And it's ironic I put her last, considering I was reading a poll stating 65% of people thought Shay should have won, but evidently, I don't feel the same. But first, the positives to her game. She's physical. And that's about it. Like we see early on, she actively puts herself on the bottom of the tribe, alongside Brianna, by targeting Chrissy, who is within the core majority on water and brawled with her for an idol, only usable at the first tribal council. After unsuccessfully getting the idol, Shay gets an idol in the second episode, but is manipulated by Khan into keeping the idol. And the votes are rather interesting at this tribal, as everyone loads up on Brianna, meaning Shay could have idled Brianna and got an eye Chrissy. So either Khan was confident Shay wouldn't disobey him, or the majority were willing to sacrifice Chrissy. However, to a certain extent, I feel it's good from Shay to not be split on at this tribal. However, at the swap, she once again is on the bottom and burns her idol at the extremely obvious Sandra boot. Now I know it's been discussed that Shay tried to burn her idol to gain favour from the majority, but all she does is waste the one tool she could have used to make a power play or flip the dynamics. Instead, without the idol, she's again on the bottom. For the next while, she is continuously brought up as a target and would have been voted out at the final 14 had she not won immunity. This tribal was also a fire making challenge where Shay would have had to compete against her boyfriend Ben. Once again at the merge, Shay is at the bottom but she really doesn't seem to fight the current much and gets to the final 10 where finally she makes a pitch to Michelle, Jordy and KJ that they're on the bottom and need to work together. However, even with the pitch, she's unable to flip anyone to her side and still has KJ plus Michelle vote her out. However, this is when she is given the opportunity to go to purgatory. But again, it wasn't explicitly stated to the contestants Shay's round would be non-elimination episode out of Jonathan's extremely vague line talking about being between heaven and hell for three seconds of a challenge. Had Shay been eliminated at the final 10 in the majority of other Australian Survivor seasons, then she would have been on the jury, but just gets extremely lucky. 
At the comeback challenge, she finishes in the top three, alongside KJ and Jordy, allowing her allies naturally, but still, even when voted out, just continues to almost float through the game. Like at the final eight, we see Jordy get revenge on his adversary Sam. At the final seven, KJ attempts to flip on Jordy to get him out, and both KJ and Jordy work really hard to flip David to their side. Shay doesn't do anything like this, however, and only gets into a position that somewhat is a majority because of KJ's auction advantage, which, in itself, was another luck based factor. Had KJ not found the parchment with her tea set, then that Purgatory Alliance would have continued to be on the bottom. At the final sec, she makes an awful social move by spearheading the idea that her, KJ and Chrissy should have an all-girl spa day, only to go back on her word in the challenge and agree to a spa day with Jordy and Josh. This causes KJ to get upset at her essentially causing the death of the Purgatory Alliance, alongside Chrissy, who is visibly upset at her. It's a really bad social move that burns two people needlessly and encompasses the issue with Shay as a player for me, where she can only identify the immediate short term rather than the short term, let alone the long term effect her actions may have. After Jordy is booted, Shay is on the bottom and yet again is forced to win the final 5 or 4 immunities or she is 100% voted out. We hear from everyone how big of a threat she is after all. While per threat management is a negative, it still can have its perks as being acknowledged as a threat yet making it to the end looks good on a resume. The issue is Shay has per threat management without even being an endgame threat. Despite making it to the end, she loses unanimously and I can't think of an endgame scenario she wins involving the final 9 post purgatory. On the topic of final tribal, I also feel Shay has a poor showing in spite of the very limited screen time at this tribal. She essentially states to the jury in the opening pitch she was on the bottom throughout the entire game and that's why she couldn't make big moves. When asked by Mel to rate her game, she says it's an 8 out of 10, which again is an awful answer considering if you're on the jury, you're going to be voting for a 10 out of 10 winner, no? After all, this is the person that will represent your entire season. However, to make matters somehow worse, she waffles for a bit in her response, before saying she's actually an 8.5 out of 10, which the jury rolled their eyes over. Now, I will say the fact it was a final 3 does hurt her, since this was the first time the format was introduced. Had it been a final 2, Shay was the odds on favourite to win that challenge and would have taken Chrissy to the end against her. That being said, she doesn't beat Chrissy, in my opinion at least, but I'll cover that more in depth when we get to Chrissy's ranking. Nonetheless, in a final 2 situation, Shay has a far stronger chance to get at least some votes. So all in all, she got voted out, got luckier elimination was on a non-elimination episode, showed very little strategy, formulated a few plans, the only time she was somewhat in the majority was because of KJ's advantage, she made poor social plays and was reliant on challenge wins to even make it to the end. While some have said I should respect challenge wins more, it still to me is an extremely unreliable win con even if you are physically gifted. This is exemplified by the merge challenge, where Jonathan says Shay should win the challenge due to her high power to low weight ratio, and yet doesn't even come in the top two. All in all, she ranks at number eight. Now at final seven, we have the other individual voted out of the game on a non-elimination episode, and that is Tara. Now for me, while Tara isn't as physical as Shay, she is a better strategist and is within the majority more often. On her initial tribe, she was blindsided at the Atom Boot 
but did integrate herself into the majority of the next two tribals. The issue is, while she's in this position of power, she becomes rather cocky and begins debating Tessa on whether she's a flipper or not, which is awful social gameplay, burning Tessa who ends up being a swing at the final nine of that tribal. Although Peter is the main swing at nine, mind you she loses him too, and Tessa was leaning towards AK's group, Tara's arguing certainly puts the nail in the coffin. Now she does form strong bonds with Loki, Amy and Annalise on the Summertow tribe, however the issue is she can't get a fifth, and loses Amy before her and Annalise are voted out at a double tribal. But she's saved by the fact it's a non-elimination episode that instantly leads into a swap. Once again, despite being in the minority on the new Asunga tribe, Tara forms strong social connections with Luke, Jericho and Sarah to eliminate some of their old adversaries. They then pay the favour back to her when AK is swap screwed on their tribe and eliminates him over her. Despite merging down in the numbers 4 to 8, they are able to flip Henry, Michelle and Lockie. You then also have to credit her connection with Lockie, which majorly benefits this majority alliance in flipping him. After the Annalise boot, she's then blindsided the final 10 and 9, essentially through her connection to Lockie, with the vote even being split on her at the tribal Tessa gets eliminated 3, 2, 2, 2. From the final 8 and on, Tara then decides to break ties with Lockie and actively targets him. But due to his immunity strike, she's forced to vote out others like Sarah and Luke, before finally showing her cards and eliminating Ziggy at the final 6, outright, despite the dynamics looking like they were 3-3. Three three. Really, from the final 8 and on, she's in the swing position and makes the correct calls in my opinion. At 4 she sides with Jericho to give him fire, which again is the best move considering Michelle would have taken Peter to the end and Michelle was a massive threat for the final tribal. Jericho then wins fire and once again Tara puts herself into a good position at the final 3, so if she wins immunity she takes Jericho, if Jericho wins he takes her and if Peter wins he's taking her which guarantees Tara at the end. The issue is she would have taken Jericho had she won immunity, who was a tougher opponent, but she doesn't beat either at the end anyway. In fact, Tara really doesn't have anyone near the end game of that season that she beats in the end, which is a huge knock. But at the final tribal, she performs surprisingly well and presents a strong underdog narrative as Jericho juxtaposes his original narrative of being an angel on several occasions. This allows her to gain swing votes in Sarah and Lockie. While some have said Lockie was a guaranteed vote for Tara, I do somewhat disagree. Now I do feel he was leaning Tara, but he had a strong connection to Jericho as evidenced by his final tribal council speech to Jericho, literally just talking about him teaching Jericho how to swim and how much he enjoyed it. So while Tara beats out Shay for me, she did still have emotional moments, and not the good kind. No real end game where she won, and ultimately got eliminated from the game. Then we move on to 6, the first person in this video to actually play an entire game of Survivor. Although, that said, he barely does. Due to my criteria, it lands him down here, and that's George. Now if I was ranking these runners up based on personality, George would be number 1 on this list, as he's essentially what would have happened if they let Shane Powers on Cambodia. That being said, he has such a sloppy game, which is exemplified at the first tribal council, where he would have been voted out had he not found the advantage allowing him to save half his tribe. Now I know someone will ask why I consider finding an advantage better than being saved by a non-elimination episode if both prevent you from being voted out. I talk about this more in depth with Pia in my winner ranking video, so watch that after watching this, but when finding advantages, you are at least utilising some skill. While I feel the ordeal is still luck based, you as a player are at least actively making a decision to spend your time away from your tribe, searching for the idol, 
And as we saw from Ben and Winners at War, although only to a certain degree, once you find one advantage, it can make finding future advantages easier, so there is a tiny bit of skill to it. This again is far better than being eliminated and hoping by the grace of production you're saved. So George saves the older people of his tribe, seen as more of a physical liability, which was a good idea and I liked his pitch of keeping people that can contribute to the tribe through their life experiences. However, all this is undone as George blurts out to individuals like Rachel after Tribal that he only saved them because he thought they were weak, thus annoying them. Despite being handed one of the most powerful advantages ever seen on the show at that point, George essentially wastes it with his poor social gameplay. He then finds an idol and plays it on himself at the next tribal council, but the majority outplay him by burning his advantage and eliminating a strategic threat in Mitch. The tribal after, Kara, George's ally, finds an idol and things finally look up for George as he has a group of four in himself, Kara, Baden plus Wei and all he needs is for Kara to play the idol correctly. But he loses Wei due to his destructive social gameplay and the fact Wei does this is incredibly telling of just how poor of an ally she felt George was as she went from being in the minority but protected to the extremely obvious bottom of the majority alliance. Because of this, the majority once again get the upper hand on George as they have the ability to now split the vote, ensuring that a member of the minority is guaranteed to go. In spite of this, at Tribal, Kara plays the idol on George, which you do have to credit George with as he was able to build such strong social bonds with Kara that she essentially was willing to pull off the suicidal move for him. However... This is the third advantage played in a row to save George at the first three tribal councils he attends before the swap. So while George blocks the majority of the votes, Kara is eliminated on the revote, but it's not an elimination. While George himself never gets eliminated, the fact his closest ally gets saved by this non-elimination episode is massive as it aids him in a strong position at the swap and means he has more leverage at merge compared to a normal elimination where she would have obviously been eliminated. Because of this, she swapped to the Brawn tribe and the brains lose the next challenge, meaning they have to go to tribal again. So again, George is about to be booted, but Healy comes to his aid, not necessarily because of her seeing him as someone she needs to save, although she likely acknowledged him as a future ally, her main rationale for this flip is to break a tight four. And even then, she really struggles to flip Rachel to be the fifth in their voting block, just because of how badly George managed their relationship. So while she does save George, it's really Healy that comes to the rescue by using her connection with Rachel to flip her over. At the swap, George plays well by integrating himself and Kara with the bronze, which gives him the majority on the tribe until merge. The issue is he loses DNA at the first tribal. But while the edit makes it out it's his fault for this super complex plan, in reality it's just a vote split Kara couldn't follow, putting her more at fault for me. Although supposedly she did this purposefully because DNA wanted to quit. Nonetheless, George is still decently positioned and is even a swing at the tribal where Rachel is booted. At the merge, George continues his great positioning by being in the swing position with Kara. This is when George really exercises his fantastic strategic skills by pretty much single-handedly orchestrating the Kez blindside alongside the brains and eliminates her with an idol in her pocket. In fact, he even micromanages Laura's vote so she puts a vote on Danny in the event Kez does play the idol on herself, and he still puts his vote on Laura, meaning two things. Firstly, it forces Healy to burn her idol on Laura, because the Bronze plus Kara and George still have the majority, as well it means he can keep up appearances he was blindsided along with the Bronze tribe by the idol play, which is key to the dynamics of the next round. 
Despite orchestrating the move, we still have the Bronze, particularly Danny, standing by George and refusing to believe he betrayed them, which is fantastic social gameplay from him. Even in the next two rounds, when Healy is severely overplaying her hand and essentially goes on a kamikaze attack to get out George, the Bronze still stand by him. He even convinces Andrew that Healy is somehow after him, resulting in her being eliminated unanimously, and in the end, she actually votes for Andrew over the individual she was pushing, George. On Healy's return, George then flips back to the brains to blindside Gerald, which although a big move, does put the nail in the coffin in his working relationship with the bronze. At the final nine, there was a weird twist mandating an insane five people to win immunity, resulting in George winning. At this time, he also discovers yet another advantage, allowing him to secretly save Kara, which is massive as she would have been unanimously eliminated at this tribal. Moreover, the advantage allowed George to save Kara in secret, as per the idol's conditions, but he so obviously was the one behind it, that the tribe almost instantly identify him as Kara's saviour. But at this point of the game, Healy really steps up her game, and George's game essentially nosedives, something Tara somewhat showed, but George definitely is guilty of is what I refer to as Jackie Peterson Syndrome, where they're very good within a core group, but struggle to bond with those outside it. George really comes off as a massive jerk towards Emmett and Andrew, making personal insults. This is extremely bad gameplay short and long term. Within the short term, it causes him to be the target of the Minority Strength Alliance and completely reliant on Healy and her swing position to save him, but long term people just don't respect him. He's emotionally targeted by Danny and Flick from the final six on, for being seen as someone that's unlikable. Then at the final four, we get perhaps the darkest timeline in Survivor history, consisting of three people voted out of the game, and George who, as we've clarified, barely survived thanks to numerous advantages. At four, he's put in a really bad situation, exclusively thanks to Healy's strong positioning, where he's either forced to get rid of Healy but go into a final three where he and Kara have a very small shot of beating Flick, or the situation we see play out, where George votes alongside Healy to eliminate Kara. This keeps Healy in the game to beat Flick, but means George has a small shot at winning at the end game. Healy then wins the final three challenge and takes George to the end. At Final Tribal, George has an initially strong first statement, but completely flops coming into the jury questioning phase. He's very nondescript with his answers, making many jurors laugh or awkwardly look at him, and for Andrew's question, he asked George if he had one regret. And bearing in mind, Australian Survivor is an entire 48 days long. George couldn't say one thing. He had the perfect opportunity here to talk about his regret for his borderline rudeness to Emmett, Andrew and others, but refuses. Emmett also asks him if he'd burn bridges on a redo of the game like this original game, and he again gives non-descriptive answers, frustrating Emmett, and after being asked the same question by Emmett three times, George eventually tells him, if it's not good enough for you, that's fine, you're entitled to your opinion, which is just an awful thing in my eyes to say to a jury member, deciding your fate. Really, George has a self-destructive final tribal, constantly bashing on how amazing his game was with an air of superiority that reminded me of Russell Hans's final tribal performances. That being said, he still does gain two votes at the end, which is more than the next four people will be talking about. This is also impressive considering he gets Laura's vote, who you would have thought would have been a vote for Healy. But in spite of his positives like good strategy and receiving two votes at the end, George has so many negatives, including the fact he needed to play an advantage at the very first tribal to avoid him being the first boot. Then on to number 5, we have the runner-up of Champions vs Contenders 2, Baden. Now what I will say about Baden is that I feel if you want a game with the highest chance to make it to the final two, Baden's season 4 game has the highest replicatability for that. 
The issue is, I'm looking at how replicatable these games can be used to consistently win Survivor, which is the issue because Baden's game also has very low odds of actually winning in the end. We begin with him on the Contenders Tribe, where he survives the first Tribal Council, but just barely, as the tribe choose to save him over Laura, considering him to be stronger in challenges, and even in that sense, he still has four people split votes on him. But he also gets fortunate from that point on, the contenders never revisit Tribal, as again he could have been a boot, but more importantly this allows them a massive numbers advantage coming into the swap, as the dynamics are 7 champions to 11 contenders. Baden has a very good swap as he ends up on the new champions tribe with 7 old contenders plus the champions and David plus Luke. While he is involved in these big moves against contenders like Sam and Sarah, he's firstly not the driving force behind these moves, and these moves are picking off old contenders without even splitting the vote on a champion like David or Luke, allowing them to burn a potential idol or reduce the champion numbers. It's only when Sean is swapped onto their tribe that he makes them see the light on how they need to eliminate David and Luke, but fails initially because they both play their idols. At final 14, they have the perfect opportunity to throw the challenge before merging, saving the contenders clearly being picked off on the other tribe, on top of eliminating a big champion threat. Even Andy, who is doing the puzzle with Baden, is willing to throw the challenge. The issue is Baden just doesn't seem to comprehend these facts, and just wants to win the challenge for the sake of winning it. Now you do have to discredit Andy for not informing Baden of his challenge throw, but I obviously place blame on Baden for not realising this is his optimal play. They even still had the numbers advantage, so they could have split on the champions. So while I disagree with him strategically, socially Baden is playing well by making bonds with Daisy, John and Luke, which particularly aid him. At merge, the contenders are so cracked that they lose their numbers, resulting in Baden being in the minority and dependent on champion swings to help him. We see this pay off at the final 10 by them booting David, but again, this was to aid champions like Pia and their position since Andy outed he had an idol. At 9, champions reunite to vote off John, and this momentum continues into 8, where they eliminate Daisy, but this is where Baden's relationship with Luke really flourishes. Luke does give him intel, but it's apparent Luke sees Baden as a number, rather than Baden being able to extrapolate this information from Luke. But because of their bond, Luke flips alongside Abby to save Baden and eliminate Simon. While Baden is targeted at this round, and the final 7 by Pia and Janine, it's a testament to his poor social game with the champions outside of Luke, as he's being voted despite being an easy beat at the end. Just to put it into perspective, this means Dirty Harry has a better social game than Baden of all people. At the final 3, he does win immunity, giving him massive power in deciding who he faces off at the end with, but it's just too late, because both Harry and Pia beat him at the end, confidently, meaning he's just a kingmaker. I have even went on record to say, him taking Pia to the end was his more optimal move, as I think he gets somehow even more blown out of the water against Harry, he still loses unanimously to her, which is awful. In fact, I don't think there's a single person in the final six he doesn't lose unanimously to, and I don't think he beats a single person at the end that made the merge. It's just an issue that Baden plays way too passively in the game for anyone to respect it. The final tribal between him and Pia is a beatdown, with Pia pulling no punches and consistently undercuts Baden, who fails to effectively do the same in return. Ultimately, Baden's pitch to win just amounts to him wanting the jury to vote for him, because he's trying. So while Baden's game wins on very few occasions, it is a consistent game to get to the end, which outclasses George's game in my mind, where he struggles to win and struggles to consistently get to the end. However, with his lack of strategy, inability to combat Pia at the final tribal, as well as the fact there's nobody in Champions vs Contenders 2 he can take to the end to beat, Say it with me now, he ranks here at number 5.
Now we get on to number four, and I can already tell some people are going to say this person is ranked too highly, but when you look at her game holistically, I think it's a step up from the others, and that's Chrissy. In season seven, Chrissy was very vocal about the fact she had never watched the show before coming out. That being said, unlike Baden and George, who faced lots of danger at their first tribals, Chrissy only faces opposition from Brianna and Shay that have little to no power, due to being in the minority, to flip the tribe on her. Now I don't love the fact that the majority didn't split the vote on Shay at the second tribal council, as no matter how confident you are with Khan convincing Shay to keep the idol, it still guarantees a member of the minority goes. But, Chrissy was in the majority alliance in the game, and seemed rather integral. At swap, she ends up on the same tribe as her blood pair Croc, but we see this odd relationship develop between them that we haven't seen before with Blood Dynamics, where the two actively work against each other. We've seen in the likes of San Juan del Sur that Missy and Baylor may have disagreed with plans initially, but worked together. However, Chrissy and Croc are completely different. At the final 15, we see them come up with different plans, as Croc wants to target Jesse, but Chrissy likes Jesse and wants to blindside Ben again. Ben then takes Croc's plan to blindside Jesse and tells him, which isn't great for Chrissy, considering she's blindsided at the vote and loses her loved one. That being said, it's weird, considering Croc's blindside was actually somewhat good for Chrissy, as without her blood in the game, her target is lowered and Jesse, if anything, was her closer ally. Plus Ben is only able to do this because the previous episode he was eliminated in a non-elimination episode and him blindsiding Croc is a suboptimal play anyway that causes him to end up in the minority again. At Merge she then joins the majority men plus Sam alliance and just kind of floats through the next few rounds allowing Mark and Josh to call the shots. As the purgatory twist runs in the background, we get further confirmation of the core sex she's a part of. In this alliance, I do think you have to credit her for being one of the most connected individuals in that sex, as she really has a close bond with Mark plus Josh from her original tribe, and is paired with David, so of course they're going to have a strong bond. In fact, if the majority sex was the final sex, Chrissy and David should have a massive amount of agency, with the two blood pairs turning on each other. But the purgatory twist does happen, resulting in Jordan being blindsided, and at 8, Chrissy is in a swing position, as she could side with her majority alliance, or the purgatory 3 plus David. A tribal she points to Jordan a lot, noting his distaste for Sam, and notifies Josh, but never actually votes for Sam because of this. Rather, she votes for Jordy. At 7, she eliminates David on the revote, which really seemed like a bad move for her, considering he would have been far more likely to listen to Chrissy's plans over Jordy. But at 6 she makes a very underrated move that I talk about in my Ingenious Moves video where she Adam Klein's the challenge, making Josh win, assuring Mark has to burn his second idol and this leaves Jordy without immunity so she can vote him out. The issue is at 5 where she tries to make a big move to eliminate Mark alongside the woman, but she gets outplayed as KJ and Shay don't even vote for Mark. Then at 4, the main target and Shay wins immunity yet again, but in spite of being an easy beat at the end, Josh literally writes down her name. Over Mark. While Josh does this to ensure he gets to the final 3, he still always should have taken the shot at Mark, who is by far the tougher beat. At the final tribal, Chrissy performs rather decently in my opinion, and I personally would have voted for her over Shay in a final two. And I feel like her friends, Jordan, Josh, Sam, Mark, David, and Khan, guarantee her the win, on top of Jordy and Jesse, who should have been leaning to her. That's the majority. However, I feel Chrissy had lost coming into the final trial anyway, since, comparative to Mark, the jury didn't respect her gameplay and she had no move to call her own. That being said, she does have a strong social game with many good connections. However, outside of the final two with Shay, I don't think she wins against the others that made it to the final nine.
At number 3, we're covering the first of her two games, it is Sharn with her All-Stars game. And again, just to reiterate, this is her All-Stars game. Champions vs Contenders will be covered soon. But Sharn has a shaky start to the season, as a close ally of hers coming into the season, Shane, is voted out at the first Tribal Council, on top of her incorrectly voting for Harry. On Vakuma, they then eliminate Jericho, the other winner, justifying Sharn's relatively passive gameplay for, to be honest, most of the game. However, she's in the majority on Makuta and is even at a swing position at the final nine between the Rascals and others, but supposedly, according to Nick, pulled out of the plan to save Shawnee. At Swap, she is within the majority alongside old allies like Lee and Zack, which combine with David and Moana. And while well positioned, Sharn does begin the saga of trying to appease everyone, which only serves to make her look extremely wishy-washy. An example of this is at the final 15 tribal, where she is very indecisive and votes Moana, only to flip her vote to Phoebe on the revote. I can't make it clearer, this makes her look distrustful, than when David literally has a voting confessional on the revote, stating how Sharn can't be trusted. But they only visit Tribal one more time, resulting in an obvious Nick boot, and Sharn makes it to merge. At the merge, Sharn doesn't play bad per se, as she is within the majority, but David, Zack, and Lee prove to be in stronger swing positions, plus Moana and David prove themselves to be more of a pushing agenda of the Alliance for the most part. After Harry is booted, we however get to the Lee ejection, and this does massively hurt Sharn. Lee was a very close ally of hers throughout the entire game, and would have massively helped in the end game, considering he's an extra person to slow down Brooke's challenge dominance and David's strategic dominance. Plus, he could have won immunity challenges, preventing Brooke from her immunity chain, and a vote Sean could manipulate to overthrow David. With the redemption challenges in full swing, Sean proves to have strong threat management, as even without individual immunity at the final six of that round, she probably would have been fine. The issue is, she gets manipulated by David into believing he is extremely sick, causing her to eliminate Jackie, which begins the downward spiral of her wanting to flip. After Zack is flipped on, Sean comes into the final eight tribal as a swing, and while she retains the swing position and picks the optimal move to side with, she does both in the worst way possible. After the initial vote, she tells Tarzan to flip, which would not only cause her and David to be in the minority if he actually did, showing poor strategy, but results in her coming off as extremely self-interested and deceitful. Again, to Tarzan, the person who outwardly abides by the principles of loyalty. Therefore, Tarzan refuses to flip, and Sharn doesn't also, making her asking Tarzan to flip look even weirder, but nonetheless, because there have been two votes, a discussion scenario ensues where Sharn promises the minority she will side with them next vote if they don't go to rocks. This causes her at the final seven to be in a situation where she's damned if she flips, but damned if she doesn't. If she flips, she's essentially going into the final four with Brooke, Shawnee and AK, with her being an obvious fourth, but even then, if she somehow makes it to the final tribal against one of them, they are all massive jury threats. If she doesn't flip, like chooses to do on the show, then she burns the three players she promised she'd flip to, while refusing to make a big move for the jury. It also continues her bare resume. But this just re-emphasizes how poorly positioned Sharn was after the Zack blindside a move she actively wanted Jackie to pursue. At 5, Brooke wins immunity, which is great for Sharn, as it allows them the perfect opportunity to get rid of Tarzan, David's number 1, because they need to retain challenge strength to beat Brooke. Had Brooke lost this final 5 challenge, it would have resulted in David having even better positioning, with a likely final 2 in David and Tarzan. But then we get to the final three, which is extremely mixed, as on the show we get confessional after confessional, where Sean talks about wanting the best at the end and remaining loyal to David. 
However, after the show, she said she would have taken Moana, but it's hard to tell who she would have taken to the end had she won final immunity, which in itself was also apparently flawed as a challenge because it didn't consider the different heights of the contestants. In regards to Moana, she was not only less threatening at the end, but someone the jury had less respect for, meaning Sean probably beats her at the end had she taken her to the end. But David wins immunity, and I do think you have to credit Sean for getting David to take her to the final two, despite being the tougher challenge. And unlike Baden or George, who don't win either final three scenario, Sean had the game winning final two with Moana, it's just an issue of, of if she actually goes through with it. At Final Tribal, her wish-washy gameplay is challenged by Tarzan and AK. AK is notable due to the fact he offered Sean a guaranteed 25% chance of the win if he picked out the right rock for her or the chance to prove her game. While Sharon eventually does pick to prove her game, she deliberates for a while, which is an extremely bad look to the jury when you're seriously considering a 25% chance over you selling your game. Moana then asks Sharon for her biggest move, to which Sharon replies her biggest move was Jackie flipping on Zack, which is quickly identified as Moana as a move that she wasn't even officially a part of. That being said, this response does debatably win over Moana, as ironically that was her big move too, but leaves the rest of the jury unsatisfied and results in her losing to David 8-1. Something I'll also cover now is that this was an all-star season and due to Sharon being seen as the you should have won figure on her original season, she likely toned down her gameplay to avoid being targeted, but like Baden, she overdoes it. It's not like Tony in Winners at War, who is a threat coming in and starts off slow then begins to crack up their gameplay. Therefore, her resume turns out to be rather bland. Couple that with being wishwashy, making unoptimal moves, and not having a proper move to claim as her own, it lands her at 3. Although, unlike Baden, I feel she was more integral to the majority, and was in more positions of power. Coming in at number 2, we have an individual who I swapped around a lot. I consider putting their game at number 3, and sometimes even number 1, but I settled on 2, and with that, we have Lee, the first runner up of the 10 play series. Now while Lee does have big flaws with his game, overall I feel he generally plays well. On the initial Aganoa tribe, he's within the core majority, consisting of him, Phoebe, Rowan and L, meaning he's never truly targeted. However, he does make some blunders, like voting for Kat over Evan at his boot, it isn't particularly great, as well as his arguing with Rowan about the idol. At the swap, he's handpicked by Sanapu and plays, honestly, a fantastic social game. He makes great bonds with the two ladies running the game in Flick and Brooke, but also forms relations with Sam and Kylie. His positioning is also fantastic. Something I'll be referring to a few times over Lee's game is him and Elle versus Brooke and Flick with their power struggle. While the latter duo do call more of the shots, and are better strategically, it's undeniable Lee and Elle have better positioning. We see this on Sanapu, where Lee is between two groups of Brooke, Flick, Matt and Nick, or the underdogs intended to be Kylie, Jenna Louise, Sam, himself and Elle. So while Sanapu 2.0 never go to tribal, Lee was incredibly positioned and had no real threat of being eliminated, with many people above him on the pecking order, like Jenna Louise, Kylie, and then even Nick and Matt, who was rubbing Flick and Brooke the wrong way. At the merge, he continues his streak of great positioning by being in the middle, particularly at the Kate boot, where him and Sam are considered the good guys. But unlike Sam, he continues to vote for Kate rather than emotionally vote for Nick, which was better for him to keep up trust with Brooke. For the next rounds, the majority consisting of Lee, Elle, Brooke, Flick and Sam at the top pick off individuals at the bottom however, because of Jenna Louise, they are forced to put votes on Christy in case of a minority idol play, which Lee clearly doesn't want to do, but splits regardless. And again, at this point in the game, he forms a very pivotal relationship with Christy, who clearly has been abandoned by the majority for most of the game, with only Lee forming a genuine bond with her. 
We even see Christy talking about how Lee is so caring, but Elle, another person she was on the original Aganoa tribe with, doesn't talk much with her. At the final seven, we obviously have the flip against Brooke. Now Flick does decide to flip, which was aided by her paranoia of being on the bottom thanks to Jenna Louise, something out of Lee's control, but regardless, I think he and Elle deserve some credit for getting Flick to side with them over Matt and Brooke, who she spent the entire game with. Plus, without Lee and his connection to Chrissy, it would have been a lot harder to flip her on side. And over the course of the final 7-5, to five, Lee wins immunities. Now I am against people having to win immunities to prevent themselves being voted out, and while Lee would have received votes, the situation probably plays out the same with Christy refusing to flip back and causing Flick to vote alongside Elle and Lee. In fact, Lee demonstrates good use of his challenge skill by winning the final 6 and 5 challenges, which targets Sam and Matt would have won otherwise, and ensures his majority can eliminate them. But while he's well positioned, it's at this part of the game where Lee's social game really falls apart. He treats Sam, Matt and eventually Flick very poorly. He is extremely emotionally charged and begins having this megalomaniac persona by critiquing people for trying to play the game how they want to play it. He accuses individuals that they're manipulating Christy and to stop it, which is problematic considering these are three of the last four jury members he's insulting. It's also important to note, he had instances of these, like in Kate's boot, where he bashed Nick a lot, but at least it can be argued this was because of Jonathan's prodding at Tribal, and Sam who looks even worse by being even more aggressive. But these last few votes are all him, and he looks awful because of it. At the final three, Chrissy wins immunity, which... I've said in my winner rankings, had such low odds of happening, considering Lee and Elle combined won 5 immunity challenges, but Lee would have taken the tougher beat and Elle to the end anyway, and probably would have lost to her near unanimously, with only Christy really voting Lee. But much like Sharn, you do have to credit Lee for forming a bond with a person that wins immunity, to the point they bring him to the end, and no matter who won, Lee would have been sitting at the end. So despite not what he wanted, Lee actually ends up in his better endgame situation, but then Final Tribal happens. And I've talked about this Final Tribal in numerous videos now, where it's essentially the worst case scenario for Lee. His opening speech has very little substance, and even appears unconfident in his pitch. However, I think he does get some unfortunate jury questions, as some people ask him questions about things outside of the game, like selfless acts he had do, or his relationship with Elle, which don't give him the opportunity to talk about his game. Some people, as far as we're shown, don't even ask him questions, and then we get to the hypocrisy chapter in the final tribal. Lee opened his pitch, stating he was playing with honour and integrity, which really shows his lack of perception, as he clearly had annoyed individuals in the game with this mateship ideology. It's a notion that's countered by Jenna Louise, Sam and Nick, who describe how Lee chastised their gameplay, and Nick in particular has a brutal speech. Lee then is forced to abandon his initial argument, which, although good, showing he's adaptable to the situation, Addressing his mistakes in the opening pitch would have prevented these individuals one after another, proving how hypocritical he is. That being said, Lee also gets really unfortunate in the fact Chrissy essentially lies about her game, but more importantly Vivoid 2.0, where she quote unquote began really stepping up her game, and refers to it often to jury questions. This is extremely difficult for Lee to counter, as firstly, although people do overinflate their games in Tribal, no one has ever lied like Christy, and secondly she lies particularly about the only part of the game Lee wasn't with her, meaning he can't call her out on it. In fact, the only jury member who could was Sue, and she was part of the opposite alliance, plus she was taken away at the final five, meaning she didn't even know how Phoebe was booted. Lee also gets one vote from L, which although bad, was a locked vote, which is better than the last three individuals who didn't have locked votes, or even any votes, at that final tribal. Although Sharn's all-star game 
didn't have as big a low as Lee's, it's hard to deny Lee played about 80% of the game extremely well, with only the final 6 and on being his downfall. However, had Christie and Lee's games been objectively looked at at the end, I do think Lee would have won, and I personally would have voted for Lee, but alas, he loses to Chrissy, and so ranks here at 2. Now at number 1, someone who had more flaws throughout their game than Lee in my opinion, but they were smaller, and so we have Sharn's game this time from Champions vs Contenders. Now immediately off the bat, I give massive props to Sharn for being able to integrate herself on a tribe of sporting and military legends, as we saw on Champions vs Contenders 2, there very easily could have been a mentality to keep all the muscle, with Sharn not necessarily fitting into that category due to being a 41 year old barrister, but she plays very well by joining this last minute-esque female group to put the votes on Russell Hance, and they eliminate him on the revote. And throughout the Champions Tribe, she's in a solid position and never targeted again, despite seeming to be one of the weaker players physically on first look. She also does fantastic work at the Moana boot, as she's very vocal about wanting a tribal, allowing the majority of lands to burn Shane's idol, someone untrustworthy at that point, and allows her idol to go back into circulation. Sean then receives a really bad swap where, despite the champions being in the majority, she swapped into the minority while her allies are on the other tribe. In spite of this, almost miraculously, Sharn is never targeted and forms strong bonds with Benji and Robbie, which prove vital in preventing Tegan a third shot at the game, and it also allows her to get rid of Heath. In fact, Sharn was in a major swing position on her swap tribe, as the contenders had split apart into two factions of Benji plus Robbie and Heath plus Vanilla, which would have continued had they gone to tribal again. At Merge, Sean realigns with Matt Rogers, Steve and Shane, forming the top of the Majority Alliance. That being said, she does take a bit of a backseat at the first few Merge votes, with Matt Rogers being the strategic Goliath. However, she isn't completely passive, as she still is active in winning Immunity Challenge, which, much like Lee through the final 7-5, prevents targets in Lydia and Robbie from winning Immunity. Then, perhaps the moment you've all been waiting for, we get to the final 9 round, which begins the news dive for Sharn and her alliance's game. At this round, Matt decides to target Brian, allowing Benji to flip Brian and Monica onto the core 4. Sharn also finds an idol, but it slips out of her shorts at the challenge, which I don't really critique her for considering she lost weight, and the shorts would have been loose, but I figured I'd reference it anyway. Then at Tribal, Sharn plays this public idol on Matt, only to be manipulated by Benji into playing her idol for herself. While this is an awful look, as it shows Sharn as someone that can be easily manipulated, ironically her choosing to play the idol on herself helps her. Benji has revealed at the reunion show, had Sharn gone through with idling Matt, then he would have idled Brian, causing Sharn to be eliminated on the revote. The response to that, however, is if Matt then plays his idol on Sharn, because she plays her idol on him, which causes a massive what if scenario, but if Sharn idols Matt, it still is either her or probably Steve that gets voted out, leaving her blindsided like in the real life scenario. After losing Matt, it then causes Sharn's alliance to be dependent on Brian and Monica as swings, which is difficult considering they execute a pendulum strategy and picking off the biggest threats in each alliance. Bearing in mind Lee was in a position of power at this stage of the game, I did consider putting Sharn at number 2, but figured she showed more strategy, particularly at this point of the game. In spite of Shawnee's advantage, the champions reunite to eliminate Benji, which is really just an odd elimination considering Shawnee used her steal a vote advantage on Sharn, who wouldn't be able to vote on the revote, and besides, Benji should have just idled himself and kept a steal a vote advantage until final 7, irrespective of if they thought Monica was with them. So she is fortunate that the minority plays in such an unoptimal way. But at 7, Brian and Monica flip again, blindsiding Sean in a 4-3 vote, as Steve is a dead man walking, then subsequently eliminated. At 6, Sean finds an idol, and while it is impressive she's able to exercise skills to find advantages, 
Again, finding advantages does inherently require luck, and Shane exercises more impactful skills at this vote in my opinion. Sharn does bring up the majority alliance putting votes on her, so she can block them with her idol, but is Shane utilising her social skills and manipulation, which directly correlates with the outwit portion of the game, allowing her to flip Ryan's vote. That being said, I still do credit Sharn at this vote, just not as much as Shane, although Shane getting Bran to flip his vote and Sharn finding the idol, both are two halves that allow them to pull off the 3-2-1 blindside on Fenella. With Brian flipping his vote, again thanks to Shane, Shawnee is pissed, allowing her to be picked up by Shane and Sharn to be in their shh alliance, and I do credit Sharn for seeming to do most of the work. She then adds on to this by beautifully identifying Brian as an idol, essentially saving Shane, as the alliance instead puts the votes onto Monica and eliminates her. At the final four, the dynamics look to be 2-2, as Brian wins immunity, with it being Brian and Shawnee versus Shane and Sharn. Due to her tight bond with Shane, this means Sharn is at least guaranteed fire, and considering how Sharn won the fire making challenge and the earlier immunity challenge, she pretty much guaranteed beats Shawnee. At the final three, she wins immunity, with essentially the guaranteed win over Brian, but instead chooses to vote him out and keep Shane. Although, unlike Lee, who had won immunity and would have outright lost the person he planned to take to the end, I believe Sharn probably would have beaten Shane had it been an even final tribal between the pair. The issue is, it wasn't a good final tribal for Sharn. And something with Sharn you'll see in her final tribals, particularly this final tribal, is she obviously speaks like a barrister. She's used to having all the information and you can clearly tell she was well rehearsed in her opening statement and the jury questions she's planned for and she answered them very well. Then Brian Lake happens, where he catches her talking about hearing that Matt Rogers could have been going home with the final nine and uses that to break her argument of loyalty. And again, it's very clear Sharn didn't prepare for this because she crumbles, is a lot less confident and stumbles over her words. But that being said, I have no idea why Sharn preached about having such a loyal game when Sam and Benji are even telling Shane early in the jury phase that the jury is filled with gamers and they want to hear how the final two are gamers. All Sharn needed to do in my eyes was talk about her idol finds, immunity wins, big moves alongside being a massive underdog threat and she had the game. And if she was challenged on why she didn't pick Brian to be at the end with her, she should have said how he was the bigger threat at the end, feeding his ego, irrespective of if she actually felt that way. However, she flounders and loses swing votes with the most important being Matt. That being said, I feel there were some people that were voting Shane more so as anti sharn votes, like some want Matt, but definitely Brian. That being said, despite having a really bad second half to their final tribal, Sharn still gets 4 votes with Benji, Sam and Robbie being locks in my opinion. So I mean, she is one vote away from winning the game, and that's something which is very impressive. So while she did have flaws, I felt they were less impactful than Lee's, and in spite of them, still almost wins the game, and would have won the game against Brian, so she, for me, is my number one pick. But that's the video, let me know your rankings. I'm sure there will be someone complaining I put George too low, but alas, those are my opinions. If you enjoy the Australian Survivor content on my channel, please do leave a like, tell your friends and subscribe so you never miss a video as I now begin the climb to 400 subscribers. Man, the channel has really been taking off this past month. But thank you all for your time and as always, PEACE!